UTF-8 is perhaps the best hack, um, the best single thing that's used that can be written down on the back of a napkin. And that's how it was put together. It was the, the first draft of UTF-8 was written on the back of a napkin in a diner. Um, and it's just such an elegant hack that solves so many problems that I, I absolutely love it. Back in the 1960s, we had teleprinters. We had simple devices that you type a key and it sends some numbers and the same letter comes out of the other side. But there needs to be a standard. So in the mid 1960s, uh, America at least, settled on ASCII, which is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And it's a, a seven bit binary system. So each letter you type in gets converted into seven binary numbers and sent over the wire. Now that means you can have numbers from zero to 127. They sort of move the first 32 for control codes and less important stuff for writing. Things like, like go down a line or backspace. And then they made the rest characters. They added some numbers and punctuation marks. They did a really clever thing, which is that they made A 65, which in binary, uh, binary 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. In binary, 65 is 1, 0. Zero, 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 1, which means that B is 66, which means you've got 2 in binary just here, C, 67, 3 in binary. So you can look at a 7-bit binary character and just knock off the first two digits and know what its position in the alphabet is. Even cleverer than that, they started lowercase 32 later, which means that lowercase a is 97, 1, 1. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Anything that doesn't fit into that is probably a space, which conveniently will be all zeros, uh, or some kind of punctuation mark. Brilliant, clever, wonderful, great way of doing things. And that became the standard, at least in the English-speaking world. Uh, as for the rest of the world, they, a few of them did versions of that, but you start getting into other alphabets, into, into languages that don't you really use alphabets at all, they all came up with their own encoding, which is fine. And then along come computers. And over time, things change, we move to 8-bit computers. So we now have a whole extra number at the start, uh, just to confuse matters, which means we can go to 256. Um, we can have twice as many characters. Uh, and of course, everyone settled on the same standard for this, because that would make perfect No, none of them did. All the Nordic countries start putting Norwegian characters and Finnish characters in there. Um, <laughs> Japan just doesn't use ASCII at all. Japan goes and creates its own multi-byte encoding with more letters and more characters and more binary numbers going to each individual character. All these things are massively incompatible. Japan actually has uh, three or four different encodings, uh, all of which are completely incompatible with each other. So you send a, co a document from one old school Japanese computer to another, uh, it will come out so garbled that there is even a word in Japanese for garbled characters, which is, I'm probably mispronouncing this, but it's uh, mojibaki. A bit of a nightmare, but it's, it's not bad, because how often does, does someone in London have to send a document to a completely incompatible and unknown computer at another company in Japan? In those days, it's rare. You print it off and you faxed it. Uh, and then the, the World Wide Web hit, and we have a problem, because suddenly documents are being sent from all around the world, all the time. So a thing is set up called the Unicode Consortium. Um, and in what I can only describe as a miracle, over the last couple of decades, they have hammered out a standard. Unicode now have a list of more than 100,000 characters that covers everything you could possibly want to write in any language. English alphabet, Cyrillic alphabet, uh, Arabic alphabet, um, Japanese, Chinese and Korean characters. What you have at the end is the Unicode Consortium assigning 100,000 plus characters to 100,000 numbers. They have not chosen binary digits, they've not chosen what that should be represented as. All they've said is that that, that, that Arabic character there, that is number 5,700 something. And this, this linguistic symbol here, that's 10,000 something. I have to simplify massively here because there are about, of course, five or six incompatible ways to do this. But what the web has more or less settled on is something called UTF-8. There are a couple of problems with uh, doing the obvious thing, which is saying, OK, we're going to 100,000. That's going to need what? To be safe, that's going to need 32 binary digits to encode it. They encoded the English alphabet 
in exactly the same way as ASCII did. A is still 65. So if you have just a string of English text and you're encoding it at 32 bits per character, you're going to have about 20, some sort of 26, yeah, 26, 27 zeros, and then a few ones for every single character. That is incredibly wasteful. Suddenly, every English language text file takes four times the space on disk. So problem one, you have to get rid of all the zeros in English text. Problem two, there are lots of old computer systems that interpret eight zeros in a row, a null, as this is the end of the string of characters. So if you ever send eight zeros in a row, they just stop listening. They assume that the string has ended there and it gets cut off. So you can't have eight zeros in a row anywhere. Okay? Problem number three, it has to be backwards compatible. You have to be able to take this Unicode text and chuck it into something that only understands basic ASCII and have it more or less work for English text. UTF-8 solves all these problems uh, and it's just a wonderful hack. It starts by just taking ASCII. If you have something under 128 that can just be expressed as seven digits, you put down a zero and then you put the same numbers that you would otherwise. So uh, let's have that A again. There we go. That's still A. That's still 65. That's still UTF-8 valid and that's still ASCII valid. Brilliant. Okay. Now let's say we're going above that. Now you need something that's going to work more or less for ASCII, or at least not break things, but still be understood. So what you do is you start by writing down 1, 1, 0. This means uh, this is the start of a new character, and this character is going to be two bytes long. Two ones, two bytes. A byte being eight characters. And you say in this one we're going to start it with 1, 0, which means this is a continuation. And then all these blank spaces, of which you have five here and six here, you fill in the other numbers. And then when you're calculating it, you just take off those headers, and it understands just these as being whatever number that turns out to be. That's probably somewhere in the hundreds. That'll do you for the first 4,096. What about above that? Well, above that, you go one, 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 zero, meaning there are three bytes in this. Three ones, three bytes, with two continuation bytes. So now you have one, two, three, four, ten, sixteen spaces. You want to go above that? You can. The specification goes all the way to 111-1110-X with this many continuation bytes after it. It's a neat hack that you can explain on the back of uh, a napkin or a bit of paper. It's backwards compatible. It avoids waste. At no point will it ever, ever, ever send eight zeros in a row. And really, really crucially, the one that made this win over every other system is that you can move backwards and forwards really easily. You do not have to have an index of where the characters start. If you are halfway through a string and you want to go back one character, you just look for the previous header. And that's it. And that works. And as of a few years ago, UTF-8 beat out ASCII and everything else as for the first time the dominant character encoding on the web. We don't have that uh, mojibake that, that Japanese has. We have something that nearly works. And that is why it's the most beautiful hack that I can think of that is used around the world every second of every day. We'd like to thank Audible.com for their support of this computer file video. And if you register with Audible and go to audible.com slash computer file, you can download a free audiobook. They've got a huge range of books at Audible. I'd like to recommend The Last Man on the Moon, which is by Eugene Cernan, who is the 11th of 12 men to step onto the moon, but he was the last man to step off the moon. So I'm not sure whether or not he really is the last man on the moon or not. It sort of depends how you define it. But his book is really good, and what I really like about it is it's read by Cernan himself, which I think is pretty cool. Again, thanks to Audible. Go to audible.com slash computer file and get a free audiobook. An old system that has been programmed well will take those nice curly quotes that Microsoft Word has put into Unicode and it will look at that and say that is three separate characters.